and welcome to another week of Wild Weather Podcast. We are your hosts. My name is Alicia. My name is Gillian. Today, we're going to find Tip Cullen, you should, he's an actor, and former Royal Marine. And a great guy. Really nice guy. Yeah, I really feel like that he's got an awesome buzz about him. You said that. Yeah, he Many talks times. so passionately. <laughs> Considering the conversation we've just had off camera, it's probably a really good word to use. Well, if, if you're a patron, you'll know what we mean. If you're not, you should sign up so you can find out. <laughs> and we're not talking about Bud Light here. So anyway, <laughs> get yourself a drink. And we'll be talking to you about what drinks you should get yourself after the podcast. Uh, make yourself comfortable and enjoy. So today we are joined by Tip Cullen, who... <laughs> is an actor but so much more than that um we've been chatting actually before we started recording and we're like save this because it's so good <laughs> yeah, so, talking. um yeah welcome tip thank you so much for coming thanks very much for having me so um your background is really really colorful um and i don't want to steal your thunder <laughs> <laughs> i don't know colorful is quite a quite a strong word i think it's quite, yeah. to me it's quite normal diverse Diverse, possibly, but still, it's quite normal. It's just your life's your life, isn't it? Yeah, that's true. You are who you are, and you come from where you come from. Well, you? you come from Belfast. Yeah, originally from Belfast. I'm a, uh, I had a wonderful life uh, growing up in Belfast. Probably not the traditional route to join the Royal Marines, which I, I later did, but uh, I grew up in a, a nationalist Republican community with a loving family and caring family. And a pretty chunky sort of like chapter in in the history of, of that part of Ireland, like I say, so I grew up, I was born in 1968, so I spent all my early years in Belfast during the Troubles, during the, the high point of the Troubles. So I sort of grew up remembering things like, you know, you know, gunshots, bombs going off. You know, I even got, uh, just when I started work, before joining the Royal Marines, I worked for the Law Society, and within a month, we, uh, our offices got blown up twice. You worked for the Law Society? Yeah, what as was a clerk. I was a, I was a clerk in the legal aid department. <laughs> So I left, I left school, went straight down to the careers office and joined the Royal Marines, but I was a junior still, so there was a bit of a process. I had to get mm. a few, signed sign a few forms, uh, and I had to get a job, so there was a bit of a gap before I actually got accepted <laughs> into the Royal Marines. So Law Society. I, uh, I applied for a job and worked for the Law Society, but literally as I joined, my first job was to pick glass out of uh, different files now because it had just been blown up a couple of times. Yeah. And then as we were doing that, as we were picking glass out of the files, uh, we used to get sort of ongoing bomb scores because we were right close to the court buildings in Belfast. Uh, and I sort of got introduced to what you did on a bomb score. So the alarms would go, right, bomb score, we want to evacuate the building. We go around to the pub. <clears throat> I was a, a young 17-year-old uh, and I, I thought, this is quite good, actually. Yeah, I mean, bomb scare. <laughs> bomb scare, let's get down the pub. Maybe have a sneaky beer. This is quite good. <laughs> and then we go back. But let's say in that period, uh, the offices got blown up twice within a month. And uh, we had to move offices, which was closer to the careers office. So it was handy for me to move around yeah. and, and keep an update. So being an Irish Catholic joining the Marines at that time was, again, it was a very personal sort of adventure. And it was my sort of destiny. So I made the choice and went forward with it. Did, Did you always you... want to join the Royal Marines? Yeah. Was that kind of... It's quite a spooky thing. I, like, I, even younger age. Oh yeah, when I was about seven, I sent away to try and join the Royal Marines. Uh, and they came back and said I was too young, which was surprising. <laughs> so, seven? But too I, young? Yeah. Mm. But my father, my father was a uh, a docker. And it's when I first came to England, I said, oh, what does your father do? Oh, he's a docker. Oh, he's a doctor. I go, no, 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 a docker. You know, works on the boats. You know what I mean? <laughs> And it's a bit of a lingo sort of difference. But he was a docker, and uh, I remember when I was young and I, I tried to join the Royal Marines, he, he sort of went, oh, I'll be all right, you'll grow out of it. Mm. But I didn't. And when I I did actually sort of decide to join the Royal Marines, I came back with the forms because I was junior to get signed uh, and presented them to my father. And he, he went, I'm not having a son join the commandos. And that was his part and words as he went off to work at the dock. And uh, and my mum sort of went, well, I'll speak to your dad. And that, that sort of like bond that they had and the support I've had from the family has been incredible. So really, they let me make my own choice and do what I've done. I have to really thank them for it. 
Do you, did you get any other pushback from sort of friends or from your local community? I really, uh, it was a personal choice and I couldn't pass it out there. I know today, I mean, I, I, I love Ireland. It's an incredibly important part of me as a person and who I am and, you know, who I'll always be. Uh, so I knew that it probably wouldn't have been the most popular decision of what I was doing. So I kept it to myself and I went off and, you know, done my adventure. Kind of exciting in a way, mm. like young and we've got something secret and really exciting going on, and then off. Oh, work. completely! It was, it was a, <laughs> I couldn't. Uh, the only people that knew at that time that I was going away to do what I was intended to do, join the Royal Marines, was my my parents, and my uh, brother, and two sisters, and they they've been supportive through the whole time, and it's been a bit of a roller coaster as as again years of experience as well. Really. Yeah. So your time in the Royal Marines, uh, we were talking just before we we started. How many years have you been in? Because technically, you're you're reservist, so you're yeah. still in. Yeah, I've done done just a short of thirty four years. <laughs> oh God! So you can't say <laughs> you didn't stint. like it. <laughs> well, I've, I've done regular service. I've done thirty years. So I joined up as a as a Marine. Uh, my aspirations were to become a Royal Marines mountain leader because just before I joined up, there was I knew I was going to join the Royal Marines. But there was a programme on the television called Behind the Lines and it was about Royal Marines mountain leaders. And even now I sort of nip into YouTube and have a look at it. And <laughs> it's incredible. It's absolutely still it really holds its worth. I know it looks it looks really old now, but at the time I was just going, That's amazing. And it's quite spooky that some of the people that were on the program are still friends of mine. I, I met in the wow. core and and they're some of my closest friends. And it, it just never thought that would happen. But I thought that's what I have to be. And so I joined up. Uh, went for two commander, which is why I live in the southwest, uh, and I bedded my roots here, uh, and then just followed that path. Went into the recce troop, done my leaders course, and basically stayed in either commando units or in reconnaissance units for most of my career up until I think I was commissioned. Then I had to sort of like grow up a bit, which, <laughs> which I mean, after twenty four years, I suppose it was time I had to sort of stop playing commandos. Mm. So operational tours include uh, quite a lot, really. Yeah. Uh, globally, so I, I have done a lot. I've done uh, well, just global. <laughs> Whatever's been on the telly, I've sort of been part of it. I've been yeah. at the front of it. And what are the most memorable? Well, I mean, there's uh, for me, they're all incredibly memorable. It's all the people you work with. So the operations themselves, they bring their own challenges, uh, whether it be peace support operations, whether it be kinetic all-out battle. Uh, and it's it's quite spooky because some of them can be quite addictive. And I know people that get involved in, you know, contacts and a kinetic battle, you know, where, where it's life or death, it's it becomes quite addictive. Yeah, I've spoken about this actually with, um, with my husband suffering with complex PTSD. It's a, an issue that we've pulled apart quite in depth and spoken to other people about and it's that um it's the hook to the adrenaline and the the feeling of um the buzz that you get out of it i mean yeah. i've i've never I've, I've fired a weapon but i've never fired a weapon in um sort of in conflict times um but i i can only begin to imagine the buzz that you would get out of being in that situation and because the adrenaline's linked to it and then it ends, mm. you want to seek that high again. Yeah, I think I do think it's it can be an addiction. And I've seen it in some friends where it has appeared like an addiction and they've they've chased it looking for that mm. that fix every time. And it's like you and said earlier, not, once yeah. you're out it's the yeah. kind of come down yeah. as well of you not you've not got those hormones and emotions and feelings going around you anymore, yeah. those chemicals, exactly. It's um but, but with how it, do you I, find that? It is, but it's it's for me and the people I've worked with, it's that, you know, the lows, you have them, but it's that ability to get back up again mm -hmm. and, and try and find new highs. So you still yeah. get, because life, if if you have life and there's no highs or lows, it's not really living. Yeah, exactly. But it's just that ability that to, to bring those highs and lows and just sort of bring them into an acceptable wave, whereas you can get... And be honest, with the life experience of, of having so deep lows and so high, you know, so mm. big highs, you should be a far better person. Yeah. But again, individually, we are human beings, so it's different people deal with differently. And, uh, and it's, 
I would like to be in a position where I can support people to get that sort of temperament and to use those those experience they have to, you know, better everything, you know, better yeah. their life, better people's lives. You know I mean? It's about um, having a lived experience so that you can not impart that knowledge with force, but just share your experience so that others are able to um, understand that you are talking from experience. You're coming from a place of knowledge and understanding. Um, and then it helps to bring out their issues. I mean, yeah. it, it, like having, we've spoken to Big Granty about this and to Pete Kelly when we interviewed them, that the, the kind of the brotherhood extends beyond leaving the Royal Marines or, or any military service. And it's about making sure that you don't lose touch with some of those people that understand your experiences. Mm. Yeah. So that if you're well mentally, but they're having a hard time, you recognize their symptoms and you can help them address their issues and bring them around to make sure that they've got support in place when they need it because you know that they would do it for you too. Oh, completely. And I, I see it with, you know, I say the, our breakfast club and, and people that are... I was about to say, you mentioned you have the breakfast club. We have, we're just like a, a rowdy gang of sort of like <laughs> former service people in Plymouth. So we meet up and have breakfast. But it's, people have all had different experiences, but they need that, like you say, the... People of the same cloth, they go, you've been there, you understand this. Do you have these things? Does this happen? Mm -hmm. I mean, I have had emotional times where even I was in Switzerland and it was just, there was a song played. We were listening to music, having a beer, just been on the mountain. Uh, we can back down and there was a song came on the, somebody was playing on their iPod and uh, I just started welling up and, you know, it was quite emotional. And I was sitting with the guys I've been on operations with and they just looked at me and just, they took it for granted. They're going... Oh yeah, that's that's normal. That's normal. And yeah. I, and it, to me, it felt it felt you know empowering, but you know, and liberating as well. So I gone, yeah, I don't know why that happened, but I think I needed it. You it's know bizarre I mean? that you should say that because I actually went to a bootneck wedding at Commando Training Centre on Saturday, um, and I started bawling at the first dance, but I wasn't crying yeah. because of the, the bride and groom dancing. I was crying because of the song that was played. And there was a lady behind me and she recognised what was going on and she just put her arm really gently on my shoulder yeah. and it's like, she knows. Yeah. Yeah, it's really bizarre. And I, then once I felt it coming, that was it. And I'm not a crier. I don't, I don't cry. It was like, nice, isn't it? I'm it, dead it, inside. <laughs> yeah. But it, I, it felt good. Like, but, but that trigger of that one song. Yeah. And I luckily, because I know my own mental health really well after having my own breakdowns previously, I knew that what had triggered it, so I understood it, I accepted it, and then I was done with it. But there are so many people out there that don't understand their triggers and their mental health. Well, for me, it was, I sort of understood this was going to happen. And it was a friend of mine who was in the Falklands, who was a mountain leader as well. And when we came back from Italy in Iraq and we lost all the guys, uh, he said, he said, he said, and he, and he came up completely out of the blue, just came up with this story and said, when we came back from the Falklands, I was in the house just watching the telly and something was coming on, a documentary on the Falklands. So I thought, I'll watch this. So I made a cup of tea, he said, sat himself down. And he said, just as he was watching it, the first opening shot of the, the documentary was just a jet coming over the top mm -hmm. of, you know, the, you know, was that signed? And he said he just he just swelled up and he just had, was sat there and watched the whole rest mm -hmm. of the program in tears. But he didn't, he didn't feel weak about it. He just thought all these emotions just, just, or out at that yeah. time, yeah. and it was just that little one trigger. So in a way, when it happened to me, it was sort of, you know, for, for, from from what you felt was nothingness, but it was just like a release, and it was yeah. it was in a company where I'm quite happy I've done this, I'm quite happy I've done it with with friends, and I say to me it's never a breakdown, and people say, well, you must suffer from PTSD, you know, and and, and I go, no, and I I know people that have, and have people that are you know going through that that those challenges that that PTSD, you know, gives them daily. I said, I don't think I have, yeah. but I've been exposed to traumatic experiences. But I've just got a human sort of like, yeah. you know, I'm, well, I'm having person. an emotional reaction to yeah. something doesn't mean that you have PTSD. They're no. very complex. To, no, to completely. It's condition. not, it's not, I mean, mm. but people would throw that and go, oh, yeah. And I'm, no, 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 that's not, that's not what it yeah. is. You know what I mean, mm. it's, it's that ability. But, but, but my friends that, that have, or have been diagnosed and been suffering with PTSD, I like to be able to just keep a wary eye on them, you know what I mean? Mm. And just, let them know that there's somebody they can come and see and go, I know where I can tell to. And you get to eat a fry up at the same time with Breakfast Club. What oh, no, no, that? we're quite healthy now. And, <laughs> and, you know, I mean, Pusser provided. You know, Pusser used to give us a, a Pusser's, you know, 
fried English breakfast every day. So oh, now we're, we're, we're quite healthy now. Where do you Except go? Except we've been on the beer. Where do you go for it? Is it weekly? It, it's whenever, you know, it's just a call. It's a WhatsApp group, isn't it? So yeah. oh, nice. it's like, right, anyone fancy go for breakfast? Oh, and we so just sort of like... Different I mean, place each we time. need to start that. Yeah. It is. <laughs> we see each other nearly every day anyway. I know. <laughs> Why are we not doing breakfast, Julian? <laughs> <laughs> We can do breakfast if you okay. want to. Okay. Deal. We normally have crackers, biscuits, but we're trying to be healthy. Happened. I know. Fruit and yogurt. Yeah, I haven't even got any fruit and yogurt in. I need to go shopping. Anyway, we digress. Hold on, ladies. <laughs> you offered me gin or coffee. You know what I mean? Yeah, we should say, actually, if you're watching on YouTube, there are a lot of glasses on the table. It's because we've got gin and coffee. Yeah. There. Well, we couldn't not. We, uh, part of the process for us is trying to support veteran businesses through doing the podcast. The podcast isn't just about veterans um, and the armed forces. It's so much more than that. But because of our links to the armed forces through um, me being married to the military, technically, um, and Julie and I both volunteers for so many military charities. We both live in Plymouth. Obviously, we've got family members in the military um, that we really wanted to be able to provide a platform for people coming out of the military to talk about what they're currently doing so they can help inspire others but also veteran businesses so actually this coffee is a dead mammoth coffee company which is run by Whoa. a veteran <laughs> and it is good it's stuff very good i agree <laughs> there you go <laughs> cheers dead mammoth thank you very much we uh we'll um, happily accept more of your free coffee <laughs> <laughs> yeah so moving on from your, uh, we're not using the term colourful career in the Royal Marines, <laughs> although I bet you could tell some more stories that probably aren't fit for um, for oh, listeners. Every Royal care. Marine does. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, it gets quite spooky. I'll tell you one though, we were God. watching, me and my wife were watching, I think was it in, no it was uh, Grantchester the other night. Oh right. And the guy starts off, yeah. he's running naked down the street and he ends up, he's, he's the guy that does on LSD or something. But I was doing that and I was just remember going, Makes a difference. He hasn't got a German helmet on or a paper bag, has he? And gone ah. And I remember when I owned a flat in Plymouth, I'd lost spoof, and I had it was a midday, you know, beautiful summer's day, and I lost spoof, and I had to run up the street naked with a German helmet on and a and a paper bag, bollocky buff, and do three laps of a lamppost at the end of the street <laughs> and run back again. <laughs> and I lost. And I just thought, ooh. But if, if you don't know what spoof is, so um, you have three coins. Um, and you're in a, a ring of steel, so there's a, there's people all in a circle, and you put your hands behind your back, and then you choose how many coins you're going to put into the middle in one fist, um, and then you have to try and guess the total of how many coins are going to be in the middle of the circle. But when Marines play this, I mean, my brother was in the army, and I'm not sure whether they do much spoof in the army, but certainly my, in my experience with Marines, you don't just spoof for a laugh. You spoof. <laughs> if you lose spoof, you are literally... You're done for. Uh, getting a tattoo, running around naked in the street. I know one man who's actually swam the channel because he lost spoke. Oh my <laughs> god, that's extreme. That yeah. is extreme. Yeah. Um, or or downing like me. really nasty concoctions of disgusting uh, drinks it, and the, various yeah. other things. Eating toilet biscuits. Yeah, up, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Or sticking them up your nose for a certain length of time. <laughs> Bleaching them. It's very uncomfortable. That. Disclaimer: Do not do any of that stuff. Don't eat no, toilet no, biscuits. Do not try this at home. But that was that was that was in the old days. That was in the old days. Don't do it. Don't, yeah, do don't even try it. Tell me it doesn't happen anymore because no. I've seen many in it. In fact, the wedding I went to on Saturday, there was I saw very many bottoms. Oh, quite pleasant. Yeah, yeah. yeah went naked bar. But that's yeah. a whole other story. Yeah. So <laughs> mo moving Move on, on from uh, naked marines. <laughs> Um, oh so, no, I like to talk about naked marines. <laughs> <laughs> talk about that. Depends on the need you limit that one. At a certain time, you become proper. You're still a, a crunchy old, crusty Royal Marine. So, although we do keep ourselves in good nick, you've still yeah. got it too. <laughs> yeah, you still got. Thank it. you very much. Thank <laughs> you very much. <laughs> so, towards the end of your full time career in service. Um, which you, did you say was 30 years? Yeah, just short of 30 years. I've done full time career. So, technically, did you retire as ca a captain? Yeah, well, I didn't retire. I done a, a what we call, and this is this. It's good to get out there. Actually, I done what is a seamless transfer. I, I approached the reserves and said, well, the reason for it was, I was the impressed holder at four two commander, uh, which is quite an important job. You should look after the finances for the unit, and you guys know you don't get anything or do anything in this life at all unless it's you've got the capital or the finance to achieve it. Yeah. You know, you see, you you got to access, and that's what. Whatever you do, whatever industry you're in, or whatever job you do, you need to have finance to, to make it move forward. So, especially with the military, the, you know, 
nothing is done unless it's measured financially and it can be achieved. And I, as the impress holder, you sort of do that as well as the day-to-day -day financial runs of the unit. You do it. But I've, before that, I'd spent like what, quite a long time playing commandos. So to my first proper, I'd just come back from operations with the Brigade Recce Force and Herrick 14. I was drafted to 4-2 and I was now the impress holder. Again, a very important job, but I'm in an office and I thought, ooh, ooh. This wasn't Got exactly <laughs> what I joined up for. It was brilliant. I was still in the commander unit. You know, I loved it, but I, this wasn't what I joined up for. So I sat there and I thought this would never happen because all I ever wanted to be was a Royal Marine commander, Royal Marines commander. And I sat there and I thought, hmm, it's time to do something else. Mm -hmm. And just at that time, I was going on draft again, back to 30 commander at Stunhouse which was the same unit as my son was in. So I thought, you know, in the same commander unit as your son, maybe it is time to do something else. As I reached over and put my reading glasses on, I thought, if I have to call a fire machine, and go, going, oh, hold on a second, I've just got to get my glasses on, look at me map, zero in, okay, maybe it's time to do something else. Mm -hmm. So I, I sat there and go, right, what shall I do? Uh, and in the military, you've got this thing called Enhanced Learning Credits, or LCAS. Mm -hmm. And if you're a non-graduate, they will support you to go through and you know pay for your tuition fees at university. So I looked at Marge on university and I, I was really, because most Royal Marines are quite good storytellers, I was looking at creative writing. So I wanted to be able to sort of like put pen to paper and just, you know, I mean, tell tales and, you know, tell stories and enhance people's lives. Uh, but as I was researching it, I looked across and there was a, a degree in acting. And then I thought, well, acting, right? That's easy, isn't it? You just, you just act, don't you? I love that. You know, just act, don't you? you just, well, it's, yeah. and, then, and then you map across, you go, hold on a second, everybody acts. You do it every day. Mm. When you go to the shop, you do, you do this. And then, and then I tried to map across my career, and I thought, when I was doing that Shura in Afghanistan, you, you're going into a village, and you're going to meet the elder of the village. You're going, well, where does he want me to be? I mean, do I, does I want, do I want him to be slightly f afraid of me? Do I want him to, to love me like a brother? So you approach it and you become a cross yeah. and you're selling yourself, just getting a message across. So you have to achieve a mission. So I thought, you're always acting in some way. And even the, the terminology, I mean, you go to a theatre of war, theatre, you're always having to perform, you're measured for your performance, your rehearsals, any op you do, you rehearse, you yeah. rehearse, you rehearse, make sure it's perfect. And I thought, well, this is incredible. And I, and I thought, I've got to do this. This was it. I had to do this. And... It's a really like interesting way of looking at yeah. becoming an actor. It's making me think I should <laughs> but, uh, be an with actress. It, uh, with it is, I think it is, it is, but it's... But it makes sense. It's like yeah. perfect sense, what you're saying. It is, isn't it? But even, even if you go and, even if somebody out knocks on the door, you go, yeah. you have to perform, don't you? You don't, you, do. you know, I mean, really, and every person does it, but it's, I learned that it's not that easy, you mm. know what I mean? And there's different things. You, you, you've been exposed to it as well. It's not that easy, but I, I looked at the right, this is what I'm going to be, I'm going to be an actor. So I submitted my notice, but my, my partner, my wife, was like, could you possibly join the reserves when you leave? I said, why? I'm doing this new thing, what, why? And she goes, because I think you, you'd be very hard to live with if you just become, <laughs> you go to university and become an actor. And I'm going, I don't think so. But she was so right. Yeah. So i done the seamless transfer into the reserves and that sort of break from academic studies and, and training as an actor to, you know, meeting the guys, mm -hmm. tuning fat, going back into the world that I was so used to, it helped me and helped my transformation. So, and a lot of people don't have it. Like you say, people that, that get medically discharged and they leave, they don't have that transformation period. Yeah. They don't have a, a good solid transformation period. Whereas if the opportunity becomes the reserves, and still have that that Wednesday night, you know. Yeah, it's nice to have that night. comfort blanket, yeah. some familiarity. Yeah, and it, but it helps you. For me, it's transformation after thirty years. Just that transformation to, to go right. I've landed on back in society properly, and mm -hmm. you know, culturally and everything, and it helped. And also dealing with wonderfully talented young people every day, the trauma and tribulations you're having when you're eighteen years old, are not really yeah. what I've been through. So you know, I mean, when when you know the the trauma of of breaking up relationships with your teenage <laughs> boyfriend or, or girlfriend or whatever else, you just are going, oh, please, I need to go and talk to some Marines. <laughs> but, but they're wonderful. And I, I learned so much from, from them as young people, but also from our lecturers. 
And so I, I trained it with the, the Actors Wheel in Marjorie University. And since then, they've, they've sort of broken from Marjorie University and the wheel, they now work it from the Barbican Theatre in Plymouth. And uh, Kevin and Amanda, they uh, provide actor training and it is incredible. So if you are interested yeah. in acting, it's one of those things, just tap into the new, new actors training, continual actor gymnastics as well. And they're, they're yeah. really good. So that's with the wheel down at uh, the Barbican Theatre. But the, the professional, they, they are professionals in the industry and they, they're continually working. So you were getting contemporary looks on how you have to be as an, a professional actor. And it set me up really in good stead. So when I graduated, I was there former, sort of former, Royal Marine, ready to take on the industry. I love that you did a degree in it as well, because like you've alluded to, at the beginning you think, oh yeah, that seems to all fit, so I'll just go and do that. Yeah. <laughs> but I've got, an, yeah. I've got a friend, a Kirsty, who's an, actor, who's an actor, and she um, she works so hard. Um, and she, Not Kirsty you know, is it? Yes. yes. Yeah, I know Kirsty. Yeah. <laughs> Hi Kirsty, if you're yeah. listening. Hi Kirsty. Um, yeah, she just works so yeah. incredibly hard, and her whole life revolves around the industry. And you can see it's how ruthless. hard it is, oh, how, how, and how I, it yeah. takes. You know, with no disrespect to anyone coming out of reality TV and getting into the world of uh, film and television, um, it's very rare that you would find a talent that would just can walk into it without any training. Yeah. Uh, it if, does take a lot of hard work. I mean, well, my um. I don't know if I've ever told you this before, but um, my sister-in-law on my husband's side of the family has a sister who lives in Los Angeles and she's in Grey's Anatomy. And she... Um, Networking. Yeah, <laughs> she, she, um, she's, she's got like, quite a big part in it. She's, she's got a lot of followers on social media and whatever else. But still, it's so hard for her, I think, like finding jobs. I think if Grey's Anatomy comes to an end, it's finding something else after that, even though she's in this established TV show that millions of people watch. Um, And she's had, I'm sure she went to like drama school and she was working in Los Angeles and and trying, trying, trying to get jobs all the time. She did the, um, she was the body and face for uh, Lara Croft in the most recent Tomb Raider game. Wow. So she did the thing where they put all the dots on you and they... (laughs) I don't know something like that, um, and she, but it's still like I'm sure she's thinking ahead. What's next? What's yeah. going to be next? It's, it, and it's think, ruthless. Yeah, ruthless. and I saw a thing the other day that the the guy that played Aladdin in the most recent Disney yeah. Aladdin film mm-hmm. did an interview saying he's had no job offers, he's had no interest, he's gone to auditions since being yeah. Aladdin and playing Aladdin, yeah. and he's had nothing. Well, there was so a lady in EastEnders um, who was completely roasted on social media because somebody saw her working in B&M bargains mm. and she actually stuck up for herself and said, I, I'm in between jobs, I've got bills to pay, I've got a mm-hmm. child, of course I'm going to take a job in B&M, it's really sociable, it's fun, yeah. Yeah. I'm okay. getting out of the house and I, I, I'm I auditioning for other roles. Yeah. Yeah. What's I, the big I, deal? I can't, but when I was at university, because like, I say all my colleagues at uni were all, all young people, when they were leaving, I was, I really thought, I'm at a good stage in my life. I've got like, my family, grandfather, and I'm like going, I'm, you know, for me, I'm like, I can do this. But look at them, they've got choices in life. Do they want a family? What, what do they want? What direction do they want? Where are they going to live? How are they going to support themselves? How do yeah. this? And I'm thinking, that is so, so hard. Terrifying. And for them to do it, but to maintain it and be persist, you've got to have severe hunger, you've got to, you've got to focus completely, and it's got to take over your life. Yeah. And I am fine that now. I mean, the, that ruthless nature. And I've met completely, you know, uh, successful, you know, actors, you know, that, they're, that are famous on, you know, mm. British TV. And they they get, they stop and they go, I haven't had a job for six months. You know what I mean? And they're, going, and they're going, oh, yeah, but you, you've done all this. And I'm going, yeah, but it's just the way it is. Mm. So. so you just got to keep in. You became a reservist. Yeah. You got your degree? Yeah. What did you do then? How well, did you take on the out. acting world? Tell us. Well, then I, my <laughs> first opportunities as such were given to me by the British Legion and, and part of the British Legion is an organisation called Bravo 22. And they've done a, the first production they done was The Two Worlds of Charlie F, which a former Royal Marine, Cassidy Little, who was on The yeah, Silver Murders last week, Cassidy. Yeah. But Cassidy, and I, I've Recently woke Cassidy again, but uh, Cassidy then was in the two worlds of Charlie F and was one of the main characters and, and it was a very successful play. Spun, spun out of that then, Bravo 2-2 went on and they 
created, uh, devised and created uh, a play called Boots at the Door at Plymouth Theatre Royal. And I joined it sort of slightly after the R&D process had sort of been going for a while uh, and got involved. And I played the character Donnie in that. And it was incredible. And that was my first year at university, getting to do, getting access to the Plymouth Theatre Royal, doing really professional stage work was it was a yeah. gift. It was a gift. And it was a brilliant play. And it was about thing, things that are really close to my heart, about service life, about the Southwest, about who we are. Uh, and that carried on. And from that, trickling on, the writer of that, Jonathan Guy Lewis, uh, he sort of, that was one of the plays he sort of layered on with other plays and other writings he'd done. And he made, uh, carried on and made a play called uh, Soldier On, which I've just finished recently. But that sort of like jumps forward. Uh, so that would give me my first opportunity was with Bravo 2-2. Uh, uh, then I carried on at university and just, uh, then I came around again with Bravo 2-2. Two, two. They'd done a national play. So it was people, veterans from all corners of the UK. And we'd done a play called Unspoken. And we took it to, uh, we'd done it originally at Newcastle Theatre Royal up in the northeast. Then we took it to Edinburgh, done a national tour. And then we finished with it at Sadler's Wells, Unspoken. It's, and again, Sadler's it's another, well. yeah. yeah. Lovely, I mean, lovely, lovely space, but it's just that, that and another incredible opportunity mm. bouncing out of that. And this is while I'm still sort of that was the end of university, so my first job was a, was a national tour at the end of university, which was incredible. And then after that, I because of that, I met up with the Soldiers Arts Academy and they were putting on a production, a bespoke a one off production. Uh, to mark the hundred years from the ending of the First World War, the Armistice, and it was Shakespeare in Remembrance, and we done it at Shakespeare's Globe. I know, and I missed it. I was yeah. meant to come. It, it was awesome. It the was one opportunity absolutely. to be at Shakespeare's Globe as yeah. well, like that's amazing. And, and was I was it Merry Wives of Windsor. No, I done that. I done Merry Wives of Windsor. I was after, but the Shakespeare in Remembrance was a bespoke one, and and it was it was brilliant. So you're in Shakespeare's Globe, and you're meeting Michelle Terry, who's the new artistic director, who's one of like the sort of like you know mm. champions. Shakespearean actors in the UK. So exciting. And that that's when I'd done a monologue which I'd sort of written myself, bolted in with a, with Shakespeare, layered in, and we I'm going for a couple of other scenes, Shakespearean scene. I've and seen pictures incredible. of you with like long hair and a and a beard, more beardy. Did you have to did you grow oh, that was, it? That was, that was it? unspoken. That was that was unspoken when we done the national. Did you have tour. to grow that for for oh, that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Love it. Yeah, yeah. Mrs. Cullen didn't like that. <laughs> <laughs> You know, I mean, apparently I had a head like a dog's ass. You know what I mean? <laughs> You've got a good head of hair, though. So yeah, you can really imagine hard. if you like, yeah. were slightly balding and somebody asked you to grow your hair, you'd have to have a wig. <laughs> well, you, can, you, you can't even put a wig on. But yeah. with it, uh, for me, I was, I look at my sons, I've got two sons at the Royal Marines, actually. One's, one's in, both in 4 2 now at the minute. Wow. And uh, when you look at them, I'm going, you know, these are my two, my eldest is, he lives up in, in, in Plimstock, and my, my daughter is a solicitor as well. So I've got a daughter who's a solicitor, it's always handy. Always have a solicitor <laughs> in the handy. family. Uh, but my two sons, I look at them, and I, you, you're going, all of them, they're not going to have to grow facial hair until they're like they're in their 40s, and then all of a sudden it just goes, <laughs> you know what I mean? So I'm sort of a bit rough at the minute for the audition I'm doing tomorrow. So I don't know, hopefully, oh, my wife goes, hopefully you won't have to have that, you know what I mean? So but so the wife prefers clean shaven, and you don't care as long as you get the job. I, I don't know, yeah, I, I, you know, to be honest, I, I, it, it's hard. I mean, like I say, the, the industry's so ruthless. You tend to get typecast in a lot of ways. I'm basically, I'm an Irish man, but the, the age I am, I've got this sort of life experience that sort of like puts me in a more grim sort of like way, and I'm, I can get typecast. But I'm, I have to accept that and go right. Yeah, don't worry, I'm gonna do that. Work with what I want to be Priscilla Queen of the Desert, but <laughs> if, if it ever happens, I was going to ask, what would your um, ideal role be? But for me, it's the it's the dynamics, it's the diversity. I want to be able to play completely what you wouldn't perceive my character mm. to be you know and and the good thing at university Priscilla was no Queen learning yeah oh yeah i mean priscilla queen Pass of desert right. you know what I, mean? <laughs> I, mean, I mean anything anything out there kinky boots you know they all work. No, no, or no. but i mean i like you know burkoff and things i know those mm-hmm. players you dig into it and you you become sort of like you know accents from like you know scotland or or i think just different accents different characters american i i, I just it, it's good to have a run-up you know to, to sort of become the character get involved and, the accent. and all it is is just to make it believable and I remember like uh, Amanda when I was at university and like I said when you're acting going right I'm acting you're like going 
straight away you're going, you're shit, because you, you, you know, you're, you're acting. You know, she used to go, right, Tommy, that was rubbish. Go back up and stop bloody acting. And I'm going, okay. So you go up and it's just believable. It's just being there. And it, I love that. And when you see good actors, when you see actors do it, it's incredible. And especially nowadays. Can you sing? Can you dance? We did do. <laughs> we did do some singing and dancing. you some musicals. Oh, well, no, that's really well, paint, paint your wagon move. No, but we, uh, a brilliant sort of voice coach at university, uh, Colin Davey, he's an incredible guy, again, local here as well, but so professional. And he taught us over the three years to, you know, how to use those muscle groups. And I thought, well, I'm never going to sing. But he trained you, you know, how to anchor, how to use your breathing. Mm -hmm. And at the end of it, you were being able to, you know, produce. And you've got a couple of songs in your repertoire so that when... I go for a distance, all right, give us a song. Well, Mark, Gillian's a secret singer. Yeah. <laughs> well, karaoke. No. <laughs> <laughs> I uh, sang in a band for, for a bit. Rose? Yeah, shall we start that? Oh, uh, uh, yeah, <laughs> I'm game for it. Yeah. I can't sing and uh, I can't play any instruments, but I'm really good at like just. I can play the piano. Get a McGregor on. I can play the piano and sing. Dance. So, play piano. Yeah. I do. I play the fiddle. Perfect. Yeah. Let's, let's go. I'll clap. <laughs> <laughs> So Shakespeare Glow, that's that for me. That's the most exciting yeah, that's um, because I'm a huge Shakespeare fan. Um, but you, I mean, obviously, the diversity part of acting is the bit that like was really draws you. You can see how excited you get when you talk about I it. And I, I love that. But I, I love Shakespeare. Shakespeare, going back to university, really sort of reignited my love of Shakespeare. Mm. And again, my wife doesn't doesn't get it. <laughs> She's just like, going, I just don't get it. And I'm like, I'm, why not? You know what I mean? Uh, <laughs> but I, I really love it. And being at uh, Shakespeare's Globe through the summer doing the chorus work with the Merry Wives of Windsor was, was incredible. But it's being in that family at Shakespeare's Globe because the diversity they hold, you know what I mean? And Shakespeare's like so, for me, is so before his time because, you know, it, it doesn't matter what, you know, you, you could be any gender, to be any character, to be anything, any colour, any creed, but all the, the topics and things really fits into contemporary world. It yeah. fits into... You know, what I mean, all the trials and tribulations. You know, and I'm, I'm not a politician, but just human beings in life. His stories, they just just fit. It to is them. art imitating life, imitating art, imitating yeah. life, isn't it? It's what favourite Shakespeare play? For me, I don't, if you had to pick it, one, but I, I like I like his comedies. His comedies are incredible because I've seen some of the tragedies, and you come for the tragedies, going, yeah. and that, you know, like chemical balance, you're like going, Jesus. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? So. The Merry Wives of Windsor was just hilarious. Yeah. I, I loved it. It was brilliant. Uh, I like uh, Much Ado About Nothing. Yeah, uh, yeah I mean, it's... it's the, the, What's yours, Gillian? Um, I like Macbeth. Yeah, I'm a Macbeth fan. Romeo and Juliet. Yeah. King Lear. I think oh, King, King Lear is great. Yeah, right at the top for me. I also really like Hamlet. Yeah, I've seen Hamlet a couple of times and I really and we did it at school. I think it goes back to that as well. So yeah. I, I know a lot of it in my head. So, I, yeah, I, I do like Hamlet too. Mm. But I no, Macbeth. Actually, Macbeth. I think it's Macbeth. Yeah. Yeah. But I'd love, and I re I'd like to keep in with the Shakespeare's Globe and with the with the people there because because they're, they're so supportive and helpful. They, it's a great environment to work in. And I got invited back for a, an audition for the for their international tour this year. I'm so gutted. I never got it. You know, just that they're so close. But I fear that I feel that I. I I've done a good show in and, and they'll keep bear me in mind for future sort of performances yeah. or, or wherever they get because it's, yeah, it's, it's an incredible place. I've just had a thought. It's yeah. actually Midsummer Night's Dream. Yeah. Well, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah that's that. a good one. But bizarrely, that, to me. I know. But I've so always fancied bit. playing Donkey. <laughs> yeah. You know? <laughs> um, yeah. So you've alluded to a lot of theatre work. Do you think you prefer being on stage to being behind a camp to being on well camera side of the camera? The the <laughs> disciplines are you're an actor, so it's irrelevant. You're are we going to be seeing whatever. you in Holby City? Is that what you're asking? I I, I do it. I do anything. It's it's that you know. I mean, I, 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 film work is so different because it's I see it as the the director being the crux of it. In film work, the director sort of holds it, so mm -hmm. you're just a picture in that that you can see that that square there, and when you do that. He's just getting your image. So it's your image. He does it. So as your performance as an actor, which is really hard enough because you have to hold that emotion, be believable, stop, reset, change it, hold that emotion, be believable. And the director makes a decision on what's 
what he wants. Exhausting. Yeah, exhausting completely. Yeah, yeah. and it's endure. Yeah, you know, you you've got to have endurance, but you've got to hold it. Do it, especially when you get the emotional scenes. You're going, Jesus, back again. Do it again before yeah. I stop crying. Yeah, <laughs> you know, really, really hard. Whereas if you on the stage, you, you you go through the journey and you hold the whole journey. Mm-hmm. You know, for the whole whatever play you're doing. But when you when you let loose, the the, the director's up there, so you've got it. You own it. And it's just your, your journey. And I, I love it. I love theatre. But I, mean, I love film work. But with film, you're captured forever. With theatre, if you make a food pie or, you know, just doesn't go the way you want it to, the next day you go, I'll do it a bit different. Whereas as soon as it's all now and the director says it's happy, you're going, it's there forever. <laughs> yeah. It's there forever. No! And, you know, I, I don't think I'll ever get used to watching myself on TV or listening to myself talk. So I'm going to listen to this podcast and go, Oh, no. We've oh, started no. putting our outtakes out there because it, it's it sounds ridiculous, but Gillian and I record our intro and our outro um, separately to our guests, and we mess it up <laughs> so we, much. Honestly, it's hilarious. It's so, such a simple thing. It should be so easy, and it takes us ages. <laughs> Yeah. Have to do it so yeah. many times. But it's, it's so funny to us. We're like, well, we're just going to share this. So we've started, we've got a Patreon site. So we share all of our uh, outtakes with our patrons just because we find it funny and they know how dark yeah. we are. So they, they actually quite, quite, quite funny. funny as well. So your audition tomorrow, don't have to give anything away, but is it, but maybe it's film. It's film. Okay, yeah. That's what I wanted to know. Is it for stage or it's film? Yeah. Okay. But it's, it's film, but it, again, it's, it, it's, it's ruthless. It's relentless. You've got to stay focused. You've got to be persistent. And I, it, it's ongoing. You've also got to have skin as thick as a rhino mm. because you you get so many... It's not, you know, that, that, that dynamics, those those mm. lows. You could so easily keep digging down, down, down. You just got to go, no, done. So as soon as I do an audition or a casting, I leave it, done. Behind me now, let's move on. Just look on the horizon, what we got next. And that's what you continue yeah. doing. And if it... If it I think you've got to have a, you've got to set your brain up to accept that and just keep doing it. Because if you don't, it, you could really beat yourself up. You can see what people do, they create their own sort of like issues, but it's not. It's because if they haven't got used to that, those dynamics. Yeah. And in a way, it helps me that transition from being a Royal Marine to doing this. It's a spooky thing as an actor. As a Royal Marine, if you give 100%, it, you will achieve it. You stay focused. And the core and the services will try everything to put you off that by some other way, by giving you that rubbish draft or whatever else. Man. But if you stay focused, it's yours. You will have it. You know what I mean? Bar injury or whatever else, mm. it will be yours. Whereas in the acting world, you give 100%. And because I'm professionally tuned to do that, I will you know, create and be the person I have to be. But it's irrelevant, especially with film work. They're going, yeah. And it's yeah. purely, it's just your image, yeah, it's you're just not your exactly mind, what the they, you they're looking for and yeah. someone else is. is uh, Two people can give 100%, but they only want one. Yeah. I, and I'll give initially, when I first, you know, when I first was trained and started doing it, I thought, hold on a second, do they not know who I am? <laughs> you know what I mean? And then you realise. I was amazing. It's, 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 a, yeah. it's irrelevant. They don't know my history. They don't know what mm. I've done in life. But it, it means nothing. It means absolutely nothing. I mean, I think in a way, it's a good way of me going, well, wow, I'm just I'm just another person keeps you grounded. who just goes you just gotta keep going. You know what I mean? And it keeps you really hard working as well because I can only liken it to uh, having to apply for the uh, for a job and the pressure of submitting your CV, I guess, yeah. is like you going for an audition or even getting as far as going for an audition. And you think, oh, I'm really in with a chance for this job. And then you don't get it and you're like, oh, I really wanted yeah. that job. But you're having to do that repeatedly. Yeah. Every time you just yeah. sort of hit but you hit it and and all I and I look for it now, and the only thing in my head that goes, I'm happy, is if I leave the audition or casting and go, yeah, I was, I was okay, I'll, I'll give my best. You know, you don't, you don't go, don't be live back over this, the sides or what you're reading and that day, you go, no, no, it was good. And then I can just move on to the next thing. Because then if they don't get me, then it wasn't for me. They, yeah. They've got a different mm-hmm. image they want. But if if I leave it going, oh, I should have done this, should have done that, then I know I haven't prepped myself properly. Yeah. So, like I said, Today, when I finish today, I'm going to go back and just submerge myself in. Just got with three three sides, you know. Get it, get in the conversation, create the character, be who I am. Get myself up to London tomorrow, attend it, see how it goes, and then. Exciting. Yeah. It. But I, but I've got to get used to it, and it's and again, remember when I said about jobs, it's all about finance. I'm right. I need to do this, so I have to afford to be able to do that. You know what I mean? It, mm-hmm. You've got to keep your sums in order. You've got to go. You can't overextend yourself, and you just got to keep doing it. But I've got. 
I've got, you know, I've got good, really strong agents. She's, she's like a mentor, Julie Fox Associates. I mean, Julie, she's, she's a great mentor. Uh, she, you know, she's given me some cracking, like, you know, opportunities. She looks uh, after you. Yeah, she is. Yeah. She, you need that guiding light, you know, like going, it's all right. You know, I mean, or she gave me feedback from different auditions where, you know, I need to improve myself or what I have to do. So she's incredible. I, I'm really chuffed that she's, she's got me on her books. Yeah. Uh, and I've also got a little finger in the pine eye in, in LA and Hollywood where oh. I've, I've got a, through a bit of networking and that, I'm trying to sort of just get a footprint out there. So this year, I'm hopefully going to get out there and there's a, a guy who's an executive producer, works with a big agency, just to, and he's quite interested in just see if he can get representation there. So it gives that, wow. that, that, and it's not, again, it's, it's like that thing, it's on the horizon. So <laughs> it's there, it doesn't matter, there's nothing, there's nothing coming from it. There's nothing. But you've got to try. Yeah. Oh yeah. yeah. So you're visualizing it. You're trying it, and actually having thought thought it through and just made a connection, you're halfway there. Yeah. Yeah. That's the thing. So it's just you know. Like we always say, if you put it out there, speak it into existence. Yeah. Speak it into existence. Mm. Make it happen. It's gonna happen. I'm really excited for you. I don't know. I'm I'm excited, but it is. There's a buzz. It's it's. It, I, I don't. Know. I love it. It is cracking. I just talked to Pete Kelly about it. And Pete sort of have also got, right, right, right. He's obviously going to tickle with the world with it. Employable. If you're listening and you don't know who Pete Kelly is, then you haven't listened or watched our first episode. Yeah. Uh, second two. episode no, two. Um, yeah. with Peter Kelly, who is a former Royal Marine and now CEO of his own business. And Employable. He, yeah, well worth listening to his podcast. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. if you were um, having to give, this is this is one of those awkward questions, but I think the listeners will be intrigued. If you were having to give a jobbing actor or a newly budding actor some advice on how to deal with the disappointments when you don't get a job, mm. what would you say to them? I think don't, it's that thing, don't take yourself seriously. Give it your best shot. Do your homework. Uh, so do your homework. Become what you have to be whenever you are pushing yourself for something. When you don't get that call, I think it's just completely push it away mm. and move forward. Mm. But it's that, and you've got to. You I think it's, you it's really to hard. It's really yourself, hard. But if you, I wasn't right for that, and therefore, it, you no, know, but it's I not right I for me. I wouldn't even do it. It's, I wouldn't honestly. I would say I'd give them hundred percent. They don't want it, so they're going. Yeah. That's it. So, but I think if you, if you, if you're proactive and go right, right, that's happened. I need to look there, and just that little thought will stop there. Put it away. It'll take you a while to get used to that. Ah, right, right. Uh, uh, you keep looking back at it. Just put it away. Mm-hmm. And it's taken me a while to do that as well. So just keep it there, just move forward. And I think it's, it's helped me not only in the industry to transform myself, but it helps me do that transition from the core and all those things that are back yeah. there. They are there. There's nothing going to change that. You know, those, you know, the luck, the guilt of surviving, the everything else that we've got, which so many war marines or service people that have been involved in operations have. But just go look forward. There's always there's always a little bright button somewhere on there. Maybe yours, may not be yours, but it's always there. And you've just got. And there is support forward. out there as well, isn't there? Yeah. I mean, it, we've talk, spoken about military mental health support before, but there's actually a fair bit now of um, actors and um, sort of stage actors um, mental health support. So I think props mental health mm. um, is is becoming quite popular, especially on Twitter. Um, and there are organisations that are supportive of jobbing actors who are feeling particularly low when they're not yeah. getting the jobs in and stuff. So there's definitely support groups out there. And if you're listening and you're looking for it, just go onto Twitter and put a hashtag in and see what you come up with and you will find some support out there. And if you can't, come to us and we'll find out for you mm. because that's important. You've thrown yourself actually from leaving the Royal Marines where you haven't completely left, but and throwing yourself into acting industry is quite a... a a big move, actually, isn't it? Because it's another really industry. No, 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 you're not. Oh no, I've got, I've got. There's a, there's a bit of a posse of uh, yeah, Phil people. Spencer. Yeah, yeah. Well, Phil, yeah. Well, I mean, I'm I'm seeing Phil in, in a week or so, but Phil Spencer, Tom Lee, Cassidy, uh, Cassidy, Cassidy, and that it's it, it, picture the scenario. We were on stage, and I hadn't really. We were doing rehearsals and that, and I knew Cassidy was a former Royal Marine, so we're doing rehearsals and that. No, no, they all look. Do I recognise him? Do I recognise him? Do I, and there was these two young lads, and I looked, you know, considerably young to me, you know, younger than I am. And I thought, I'm not, 
They're very sharp, aren't they? They're, they're quite impressive. You just know, don't you, when somebody's been in the military? But oh no, yeah, I knew. I knew you'd been in the military. Look. Yeah, that's <laughs> I mean. It was. It was. I knew, and I knew you could say you could trust people being in the military, but there was eternal. There was just something different about it. And then, but it was that. It was just you know that that we were we're not unique, but we're very similar. Oh, in you a are. Lot of ways. <laughs> <laughs> but, we're, but these quite two unique. young guys, and I was at straight away because they hadn't. You know, what I mean, obviously, I'm I'm tip telling like, and I, and they're going. Hmm, how come we haven't sort of met you in that? And and then it was just a trigger and going, ah. Oh. And one of them was in the same company as my son. <laughs> Tom was, oh, was in Charlie Company of 40 Commando. So I was like, oh. So we, and we just bonded. And like from there, we've been uh, doing Soldier On. We've done Shakespeare and Remembrance together. And then we've done Soldier On. So Soldier On was sort of like the last major play I was involved in. i just come back before Christmas in Canada with it. We took it to Toronto and work with Canadian veterans as well mm. and uh, had a, an incredible time and, and people in Canada really took the play well. I mean, we saw John, John Guy Lewis's final play. When we were in Canada, because of the veteran community there, they've been through very, very similar things to what our people are and they, the play itself, even though, I mean, it's set with, you know, characters from the United Kingdom and that and they, they really got it. They really got it and they're actually going to, you know, create their own uh, academy as such for veterans to train in the arts. Well, that's uh, good. And that's happening. So I would like to keep that, that, that relationship going. It'd be nice if Soldiers Arts Academy in, in the UK keeps it with the Canadian one. See, what I you mean, need to do, if, that, if that's Canada, you need to get Prince Harry and Meghan on board. I know, this was all before. This yeah. was Christmas. <laughs> there wasn't happening then. <laughs> so she's over there. She's the next actress. She could be a patron. Yeah, well, I mean... Let's just see how one goes in it. That's such a good idea. Yeah. Great idea. Yeah. Great idea. And when you meet them, tell them it was my idea. Yeah, <laughs> yeah Wild Ones podcast. Yeah. Right. Um, so, do people... <laughs> I'm waiting for it. I know. What Wait. was she going to say? Yeah. I don't know. This, this is not a crazy question, but when do you think of yourself as Tip Cullen Royal Marine or Tip Cullen actor, or is it a bit of both? The reason I'm asking is because when I messaged producer Pete... Um, and said, tips in. We've got Tip Cullen. He's coming on uh, Monday. We're going to do a podcast. He said, ah, oh, Tip Cullen, the actor. <laughs> and I said, yes. And he went, oh, he was in the Royal Marines as well. And I said, yes. <laughs> so, but the, his first... Well, it's working. <laughs> <laughs> but his first thought was, oh, the actor. Yeah. And I said, yes. Well, so, to be honest, that's how I see myself yeah. now. And in a way, because I'm in the reserves, I do see myself as a former Royal Marine. Mm. Because that... Over the next couple of years, that that you know, I won't yeah, be you can't do anymore. that forever. You're a granddad so now. Yeah, yeah, I'm, <laughs> you know, I'm not Peter Pan. I am Peter Pan. I mean, so I'll, I'll go on forever. But it's, I am an actor now. So it's yeah. typical of the actor, you know, former Royal Marine, mm. but now an actor. So I mentioned that we've got some patrons, um, and what we've decided to do for the patrons is they, um, we said like, what do you want to do? Do you want to ask our guests some questions or or what? And, I don't listen to Radio 1 very much, but I use Instagram a lot. And they do a few sort of outtakes and clips mm. from their shows. And they've got a show called Unpopular Opinion. <laughs> and people they call with, Sounds a bit dumb. They did one with Stormzy. Yeah. yeah. They, we all call it, it than Stormzy. It yeah. is funny. <laughs> and so people ring in with unpopular opinions yeah, and then yeah. ask their guests what whether that what they think. Ooh. So, oh, yeah. so Star Trek is better than Star Wars. Yes. It is? Yes. Oh, controversial, because I'd say no, Star Wars all the way for me, yeah, but same. okay. Okay, fair okay. enough. We, we digress. Yeah. Uh, vodka is better than gin? No. No, no. Gin all the way, people. <laughs> well, Hello. Especially Plymouth gin, I have to admit. Plymouth yeah. yeah. gin. Um, oh, um, <laughs> so here's a really unpopular one for you. The RAF don't get enough respect from the Royal Marines. <laughs> I think that's true. Deservedly so. Ooh. There we are. No, Ooh. no, I don't. No, no, I don't. Uh, they probably don't, but it's two very it's all different banter. disciplines. It's top all banter, bands, isn't it? Top bands. Yeah. Um, this is an unpopular opinion. It's just questions now. Ant or deck? I'd say Ant because <laughs> Saturday Night Live's coming up shortly, isn't it? And one night, I'd done it in London, and I had the abseil down with who I thought was dead, but it was Ant. And they were both absolutely pooing themselves, so I'm hanging on an abseil, 200 foot up, the television's heart, and there's obviously all these crowd like... Why were you doing that? 
You were helping them not sell down. Yeah, it was me and uh, Gaz Vika and uh, oh, Pete's friends as well. Like, uh, Are these inaccessible Matt Hughes. guys? If you go on YouTube, go on YouTube, <laughs> and there's this dodgy Irish book, and they came up, and they never had rehearsals. It was one of their, you know, their, they had to beat each other in yeah. their competitions. And they, they had the abseil down the front oh, of the building. Yeah, there was a race. Yeah. And uh, Ant came up. And, right, so I got him. And I had to put an umbilical on him from dying. And he was proper pooping himself. And it's live on telly. So we were down. But I said, like, I'll take it easy as we go down. And I looked across. And they were, like, going below us. So, so, so I took the anchors off. And we down. But he came second. So we, the reason he lost that night, if he's watching this, is... I put the anchors on to slow him down, oh, which I should have done. Because he was upset, but actually you should have just dropped him. No, because because we had an agreement going, well, just take it easy and just let you know, let them let them do it. But they were they were so competitive, they were mad for it. <laughs> so they were going for it. So the reason he lost was because of me. So and, Ant, and also Ant he was lost. on the radio about six weeks oh, after it. So Ant McPartlin, you lost that because of tip. Yeah, I'm sorry. Tip, <laughs> oh, oh no. no. <laughs> It's but, fine, I'm sure he forgives you. Yeah, but that's why. You didn't kill I, him. You didn't drop him to, right to the bottom, yeah. you know. That's all good. But, but they're, really, they're really good guys, actually. They're really, yeah, yeah they're really, I, we got on really well. I love Ant and Dad. Yeah. I do. Red or brown sauce? Red. Mmm, <laughs> daddy or chips? <laughs> oh, that's so <laughs> We have this conversation a lot. What, what, daddy where sauce? were they oh. thinking? When they did that advert, what were they thinking? Oh, no, Daddy, I'm sure. uh, anyone that's born before like the night early, the late eighties will not understand that reference. Do you understand? Do you remember that? What reference? Daddy sauce? Yeah. Or chips sauce? No, no, da no Daddy or been. chips. Who, was... They were just asking little girl, what do you, who do you love? Or more? Who's yeah. Dad's more? Daddy, Daddy or, or chips? chips. <laughs> and I think it was um, a McCain chips yeah, advert. Yeah, yeah, Daddy yeah. or chips? But it sounds so wrong. <laughs> <laughs> See, I was up. I was missed out in that one. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I'm going to find it and send you the link. <laughs> yeah, I need it. <laughs> On that note, thank you so much, Tip. Yeah. Again, another awesome guest. We're so lucky. Been a great guest. I'm so glad you said yeah. yes. And I'm really excited about what the future holds. And I feel your buzz and excitement. Yeah. So. I, think I just, just need to keep keep persistence. <laughs> yeah, persistence is key, and and being the person that you are because that buzz is infectious. No, good news. And, and thanks very much for having me. It's Thank been, you it's been so much for really coming. Good. Yeah. I'll be following your podcast as well, actually. And I, it's quite spooky because I have watched all your podcasts and I've gone, or, you know, listened to them. And I thought, incredible. I'm following on from the guests. I thought, I don't know if my story's good enough. I mean, because this has been such incredible Get stories. Get out. <laughs> Great story. Who was your favourite so far, though, other than yourself? No, yeah. You know, <laughs> it's got to be Kelly. Don't, don't, oh, you know I mean? He's going to know that as well, I mean, you know I mean? Nice. Yeah, he's a good egg. Yeah. He is a good egg. Right, thank right. you. Thank you very much. I had a great time today with Tip. Did you? Yeah. What Did you enjoy it? Yeah, I, I have to say to anyone that's listening, nothing's, nothing's different right now, but if you're watching, there's something different. Alicia's got her hair up. <laughs> and, oh, and there's a child on the table. Hi, George. My three was really poorly and sitting here from nursery, so say hi, give him a wave, give him a wave. Good so thank you so much to Tip Cullen for coming in um, and also a huge thank you to Dead Mama Coffee Company for the coffee. Mm -hmm. Really tasty. Highly recommend. Oh, we've had some today too with Tip, it was delicious. Yeah, it was. Really, really good coffee. So thank you. So we hope you enjoyed uh, yeah. episode six of the Wild World Podcast. Tip was a great guest. I'm really glad that he came. Tip Cullen, actor. What was wrong, Marie? Can't reserve forces. Thespian, Shakespearean. There's two of me. There's two of you. We hope you enjoyed this episode. We did. Uh, George didn't necessarily because he's not feeling great, but that's quite enough with the bum bumps. We love our guests. We love our podcast guests. And we love our podcast business. <laughs> Bye guys. Thank you.